Well, happy Friday. It's Bruce Williams again, and it's time for another Gross Path Challenge. Go ahead and grab your pencils and papers. I'll ask you some questions. You'll pause the playback, write down your answers, and we'll go over them together. Ready to go? Well, you know how I always want to thank the people who have given me images that allow me to put these quizzes and lectures together, and today is no different. Here's some people who have given me some outstanding images. And a number of the images have come to me over the years by various image collections, like the Piggy Group, Noah's Archives, and of course the archives of the AFIP, where I've worked for the last 30 years. So, with that, let's start with question number one. This is tissue from an ox. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes. All done? Okay, let's take a look. This is actually from a calf or a young steer, possibly from a feedlot, where you see a lot of respiratory disease. We are looking at the larynx is opened up, epiglottis here, here are the retinoid projections, and we have a bilaterally symmetric area of fibrin deposition and necrosis. The name of the condition is necrotic laryngitis. It used to be called calf diphtheria. The appropriate morphologic diagnosis is bilaterally symmetrical fibrinonecrotic laryngitis. And this is seen often in feedlots, especially young animals who are mixed with other animals uh, for the first time. It may be associated with subacute bronchopneumonia and coughing. And two possible causes are two agents that are always in the respiratory system of the ox and looking for an area to invade. The first one is Fusobacterium necrophorum. Fusobacterium necrophorum is an agent that causes necrotic lesions in both the upper GI tract and the upper respiratory tract fairly readily once the mucosa is broken. It can't penetrate an, in, an intact mucosa. But when the animal's coughing, these two little areas rub together. There's ulceration of the mucosa, and Fusobacterium is very happy to hop in and set up a nasty, foul-smelling necrotic lesion. The other one is Histophilus somni, a major cause of disease in feedlots, especially in pneumonia, myocarditis, and lesser-seen syndromes that Histophilus will cause, such as thromboembolic meningitis, arthritis, and occasionally metritis. Okay. These animals generally, as the lesion progresses and gets worse, and this one isn't too bad right now, there's extreme swelling of the larynx. They extend their uh, mouth to breathe. They may drool, and it can be a significant cause of mortality, but usually is due to coughing from a low-grade bronchopneumonia. You see a lot of respiratory diseases when you mix animals in feedlot for the first time. Okay. The next question is an ox as well. Let's say this is from a feedlot, just for fun. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and the most likely cause. Okay, time's up. Now you're gonna look at this one and say, boy, I see several things going on here and you probably should, but this is a case of bovine respiratory syncytial virus in a calf, very common in feedlots. In the U.S., up to 90% of animals in feedlots will have antibodies to it, and it's characterized by a dimorphic appearance. The paramyxal virus or morbillivirus virus that causes BRSV attacks quite a number of different cells within the lung and can have different appearances. It attacks the lining of the airways. It attacks type 2 pneumocytes. 
and it will attack alveolar macrophages as well, giving us some beautiful inclusions and syncytia deep in the alveoli. And the front of the lung generally has the highest viral load, much higher than the back of the lung. It tends to cause diffusely an interstitial pneumonia, like all of the morbilli viruses will do. And the caudal part of the lung generally resembles an interstitial pneumonia. It's overinflated. There's expansion of the alveolar septa microscopically, and very typical interstitial pneumonia. Okay. The front part of the lung is generally very rubbery, collapsed, atelectatic, and reddened because this is where all the viruses is, and it pretty much has wiped out all the alveolar epithelium. The necrotic debris has plugged the airways in this area, and that, that lung tends to collapse. If it didn't do that, it might look like the caudal part of the lobe. So one of the characteristics of BRSV is that the cranioventral lobe looks like you have a concomitant bronchopneumonia. It's collapsed, and the caudal part of the lobe looks overinflated. Now, there's one other thing that's complicating this picture, but when you're dealing with animals that die of respiratory problems, you've got to learn to recognize it for what it is. And this is overinflation. You can see emphysema within the interlobular septa. There's a lot of overinflation, some edema and emphysema, and this is just when the animal is dyspneic. And cattle, when they become dyspneic, they force a lot of air out of the alveoli into the interlobular septa, and you need to be able to read through that. Uh, BRSV is the number one cause of pneumothorax in cattle, which gives you an idea how, how, how much they struggle to breathe. So the morphologic diagnosis for this after that long explanation is going to be a diffuse necrotizing bronchointerstitial pneumonia, and the cause is bovine paramyxovirus, in parentheses BRSV virus, or if you said bovine morbilli virus, I'm not crazy about that, but I'm going to take it as well. When you say bovine morbilli virus to me, I usually think of rinderpest. Okay, let's move on. Slide number three is from a pigeon. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? An etiologic diagnosis, the cause, and another affected species. Okay, let's stop. Let's start with the name of this disease. This is canker. Okay, I didn't ask you for that. Canker is infection by Trichomonas galenae. Morphologic diagnosis would be a multifocal to coalescing, necrotizing pharyngitis and ingluvitis. Okay, it's in the pharynx, it's in the entrance to the crop, so it's a pharyngitis and ingluvitis. And I know you're going to look at that and say, but that doesn't look like typical necrosis to me. Well, what you're seeing is a piling up of necrotic debris and organisms and the trichomonads. Okay, we tend to think of ulcers in these areas as, as you know, depressed or at least flat. This is a little different. And I was taught to recognize canker because it looks like soft serve ice cream. So it rays from the surface and looks like it's melting a little bit, but this is a characteristic appearance of canker. Okay, either pharyngeal or ingluvial trichomoniasis would be a good etiologic diagnosis. As we said before, the cause is trichomonas galenae or trichomonas gallinarum. And another affected species would be any type of raptor that eats this pigeon. Okay, we do see it in owls and other birds of prey. The disease is not called canker, it's called frounce. It tends to be a little more ulcerative than, you know, pseudo-proliferative as we've seen here. Okay, slide number four. A wonderful picture from Jim McLaughlin at University of California 
at Davis. And this is tissue from a calf. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. Morphologic diagnosis is hydran encephaly. The development of the cerebral hemispheres is almost totally interrupted. There's a thin shell which likely represents the leptomeninges. And someone just did an outstanding job dissecting this out. I sure couldn't do something like that. Okay, notice it's the cerebral hemispheres. The deep parts of the brain, the thalamus and basal ganglia, brain stem, cerebellum is a little small, but they're all still here. This is hydrancephaly generally affects the cerebral hemispheres by infecting the cells after about between 50 and 125 days of age. In this case, it was 125 days of age because it's an experimental infection um, with blue tongue virus. Okay, and this is what it causes in sheep and calves. And there's a, a fairly large outbreak of blue tongue virus, Cerevar 8 in Europe, from which this picture was taken back in the uh, uh, mid-2000s. And it was thought it was going to devastate. The cattle injury really wasn't as bad as everybody thought, but people jumped on it very quickly and, uh, and saved what could have been really tremendous economic impact. Um, Okay, so when we think of hydran encephaly, I want you to think first of bunya viruses. If you told me that this was any of the bunya viruses, like in the U.S., Cache Valley fever, uh, uh, Akabani disease, Aino disease in Japan, uh, or Schmallenberg, even in uh, Europe, any of the bunya viruses, uh, I will give you full credit. This is orbivirus, which is a little different, but the mechanism is about the same, uh, somewhere between the age of of 50 days of age where a viral infection would just kill the animal and it would be resorbed or mummified. And 125, uh, the virus infects the fetus in utero and infects the germinative epithelium, which for the cerebrum is usually around the ventricles, kills that off, and the cerebrum does not develop. Uh, probably we had infection of the external germinal layer of the cerebellum because it has not developed to its full extent. And that's generally what happens with these type of in utero viral infections. Okay, fantastic. Let's go on to slide number five. This is going to be a little one, little easier one if you recognize the tissue, and this is from a ferret. How about just a morphologic diagnosis? Scribble, scribble, scribble. Okay, pencils down. Time to move on. This is the tip of the tail, it has been cut off. This is one of the caudal vertebra, the seventh, or probably the sixth. And that tail's been cut off, and we've cut it in half. This animal presented with a large ball at the end of the table. If you reviewed the ferret lectures uh, that are available on the YouTube channel, you recognize this readily as a vertebral cordoma. How about a caudal vertebral cordoma? And I'll take that. Actually, uh, these tumors arise from rests of primitive notochord in the intervertebral discs. Um, notochord is important for developing the spinal column, the, the discs, the cartilage, and the bone of the spinal column during uh, development. But once uh, the spinal column is developed, notochord is supposed to go away. Well, it never totally goes away, but we get these little tiny nests of it in our intervertebral discs. And in most cases, it's never heard from again, but in some cases, in ferrets and humans, and rarely rats, and I think it's been documented in cats, these little rests of notochord will go rogue and, and turn neoplastic later in life. They're only seen in intervertebral discs, so the lesions are primarily seen in the, uh, in the spinal column as well. At the end of the tail, you can take the end of the tail off and the ferret will do just fine, but when it arises, next most common is a cervical vertebra, usually around the C1 or C2 area, and of course, that is gonna cause problems because these are locally aggressive, low-grade malignancies, and they just chew through bone, and eventually, animals that have it anywhere except the end of the tail will develop vertebral fractures 
paresis and need to be put down. So this is a caudal vertebral chordoma. Slide number six is from a dog. And this is a great picture by Dr. Guillermo Couto uh, at Ohio State University. We were lecturing together in South America, and he gave me this picture. And uh, I always put this up. Okay. Time's up. Obviously, the skin of a dog, we see two masses. And if you concentrate on this mass, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh, that's a histiocytoma. And that's fine, I guess, if that was the only one you had. Um, and that's very nondescript. What I want you to see is this one here, this donut, okay? It's a round mass. The center is normal, okay? And this is very characteristic of cutaneous lymphoma, the T-cell epitheliotropic type. This is one, don't worry about if you didn't get this one right, but you're going to remember this. And I found that in most cases, it is held up. And Dr. Kuto could not explain it to me. No one else has ever been able to explain it to me. But T-cell epitheliotropic lymphoma, if you have the opportunity to look at the animal grossly, you will often find some of the neoplasms take this donut shape appearance with the center, which is normal, and the tumor forms a ring around it. Don't feel bad if you didn't get this one. I certainly didn't know about it when I was first shown it, but it has proven to be true. So when you see animals with multiple cutaneous tumors and you're thinking cutaneous lymphoma, look for the donuts. Slide number seven is a squirrel monkey. This is probably a mug shot from a squirrel monkey. People know how I feel about squirrel monkeys. They carry a lot of diseases and always seem to give it to other New World primates and they never get sick themselves. So this is probably a murderous, virus-laden squirrel monkey. I'd like a Morphologic diagnosis and a pathogenesis. And the morphologic diagnosis is more of a name the condition. So it's name the condition and a pathogenesis. And no, this has nothing to do with the deadly viruses that this squirrel monkey is carrying if you happen to be a marmoset, a tamarind, or an aotis monkey. Okay, well, I've impugned the reputation of squirrel monkeys enough. Put your pencils down. This is known as a cephalohematoma. So if you put that down as a name of condition or morphologic diagnosis, I will give that to you uh, either way. Now, pathogenesis is very interesting, and this is seen occasionally, every once in a while, when there's a problem with uh, uh, improper feed formulation, and it has to do with vitamin C deficiency. Remember, primates cannot manufacture vitamin C because we do not have the enzyme gulonolactone oxidase. So we have to be supplemented with vitamin C, as do a number of other species, including uh, fish and some fruit bats and guinea pigs. So this is not your typical presentation of scurvy, as you can imagine. Okay. This is an adult animal. And what happens when you do not have appropriate vitamin C is you have defects in type 1 and type 4 collagen due to the fact that vitamin C is an essential cofactor for lysol and proline, proline hydroxylase. Okay, well here we're talking about uh, type 4 collagen. And squirrel monkeys will develop hemorrhages on top of the skull. I don't know whether they, it's traumatic um, and they, you know, when one's not looking, the other one whacks them over the top of the head with something. It wouldn't surprise me, but uh, for, at any rate, they get these subcutaneous hemorrhages over the top of the skull. It doesn't normally happen, but when they're deficient in vitamin C and they have deficient type 4 collagen, which is in the basement membrane of the vessels, they become very leaky. So 
For some reason, they get these hemorrhages on top of the skull. And then when you restore vitamin C, the hemorrhages stop, and these are encapsulated with bone. And this is a bony change. Okay, so it's a permanent deformity known as a cephalohematoma. Great story, great picture. Okay, we're looking at tissue from a pig. I would like you to give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and another affected organ. Okay, time's up. Pig diseases are interesting. Hope you've had a chance to review the pig lectures that are available on the YouTube channel. We do talk about this on a fairly regular basis. Um, I have taught my residents, if you have no idea what's going on with a pig, just say it's PCV2 and you'll be right at least half the time. And if that's what you said caused this, you are correct. Okay, so pig diseases of the skin are somewhat uh, location dependent. Some start at the front of the pig on the face, like sarcoptic mange. Some tend to start over the back of the pig. And we're looking at, if you figure it out, we're looking at the ham right here. This is the, the haunch of the pig, leg going down here, abdomen. And we have these multifocal to coalescing, variably sized areas of hemorrhage and infarction. Remember, hemorrhage is never just hemorrhage. Hemorrhage usually represents necrosis, and that's what it does here. And if you were to look at each of these areas under the microscope, you'd probably see a small vessel in the center that was infarcted. And when we think about that pathogenesis, the pathogenesis of, of cutaneous vasculitis, two diseases come to mind. One would be infection with erysipelothrix rhusiopathy, which classically gives a large diamond-shaped infarct. And those are distributed randomly throughout the animal, often seen primarily on the back. The other lesion is due to porcine circovirus type 2, or at least associated with that. It's one of the PCV2 associated diseases. It causes cutaneous vasculitis and infarction, and it starts on the hind end of the animal, tends to move forward. So this is PCV2, and the other affected lesion, if you remember the name of the condition, Porcine dermatitis and nephritis syndrome is the kidney where you will get, uh, you will get infarction of uh, renal vessels, afferent arterioles, sometimes the interstitial capillaries, um, and even the, the, from time to time the glomerular tuft. So this is PDNS associated with porcine circovirus. Um, it is not the only agent that has been uh, thought to cause this lesion. A couple of others, including bacterial diseases like Pasteurella multocida, uh, Strep suis, and one other virus, porcine arterivirus. The cause of agent of PERS has been thought to, uh, to cause this lesion as well, but they generally do not affect the kidneys. Only two more slides left. This is tissue from an ox. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Mm. Time is up. Hopefully everybody got this one. The disease name is black leg. The morphologic diagnosis is focally extensive. Necrotizing rhabdomyositis with emphysema. And the cause causes Clostridium chauvii. Black leg is a disease of cattle, which is caused by the fact that cattle are not sterile animals, and they will preposition clostridial agents and quite a number of them throughout their body in macrophages, waiting for times of ischemia where they can proliferate, release their enzymes, and kill the animal. I guess cattle must be complicit in this because I don't know any other animal that does this. So the skeletal muscles of cows are filled with clostridium chauvii in a fairly dormant state, and then someone comes along and uh, traumatizes the animal, maybe gives it a shot in the behind, 
of some antibiotic and causes localized ischemia, and this agent starts to proliferate. Okay, it does produce gas. It has potent exotoxins, including, including phospholipases, which will result in the death of tissue, as well as the uh, hemolysis of blood in the vessels around it, so it generally is a fairly hemorrhagic lesion as well. The tissue actually doesn't have a lot of edema. It's fairly dry, but the presence of these gas pockets is characteristic, as is a smell of rancid butter when you slice it with a knife. Okay, other muscles that may be affected, especially in younger animals, might be the heart or the muscles of deglutition, including the tongue and the other muscles associated with swallowing. There is a condition known as pseudo-black leg, which you can isolate Clostridium septicum, Clostridium sordella, and sometimes Clostridium perfringens. These agents tend to proliferate more after death, whereas Clostridium chauvii mostly proliferates in the anti-mortem phase. So we call it pseudo-black leg. It may be a post-mortem finding, and uh, don't get the two confused. Okay, last one. Tissue from a wild rabbit, or Rictilagus cuniculi, and I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. We can see that there are multiple raised masses. This one's a little ulcerated on the ears. And these are known as Shope fibromas. The cause of agent is a Lepora pox virus, a pox virus which in this particular case uh, affects the uh, epidermis and to a lesser extent the fibroblasts underneath resulting in these discrete raised lesions. They do tend to uh, regress over time. Interestingly, strains of the same virus will also cause myxomatosis, which is a widespread, often fatal disease in which inclusions like those seen in the epithelium of Shope fibroma are also seen in odd, bizarre-looking fibroblasts in the underlying derma, dermis. Um, these animals generally die of bronchopneumonia. They become very immunosuppressed several days after being uh, uh, infected with one of the strains of Lepora pox virus that causes myxomatosis. So that's a fatal disease. This one is not. And that same virus will also cause uh, some similar lesions in squirrels called squirrel fibromas, large proliferative masses that whereas they are not fatal in themselves, they may f coalesce and cause severe debilitation and ultimately be fatal in squirrels. Well, that brings us to the end of the test. I hope you learned something. Don't worry about your grade. Throw the paper away and uh, have a great weekend.